X marks the spot. X marks the spot, right? You know this uh, from perhaps childhood stories or movies. You know that on the treasure map, X marks the spot. That is the precise location. That is the treasure itself. X marks the spot. So this morning, X marks the spot in this sense. In the Christmas story, the X, you could say, was that star over Bethlehem, designating the location of the newborn king who had been promised. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2 was our reflection this morning. And it said, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. In that sense, X marked the spot. It was the location of the treasure. The birth of that child, the birth of that king is the event we call Christmas. And it's what we celebrate as a church is in what we call Advent. Now that term is familiar to those who are older, but if you're younger, if you're a child this morning, a good question would be, well, why do we use the word Advent? Why don't we just say Christmas? Well, the word Advent is a meaningful word. It means coming or arrival. The coming of the king and the arrival of God's promise, the fulfillment of his promise, is what Advent is all about. And so it is Christmas, the worship of Christ, but it is the Advent, the long-promised and anticipated coming of the Messiah. Now that too is a strange word, and older folks are familiar with it. Younger uh, children, maybe not so much, but that word Messiah is a biblical word, comes from the Hebrew word that means to anoint. And so the Messiah was the one anointed by God, called by God, sent by God to deliver His people from their sins. So two key words as we begin an Advent series this morning that emphasizes the Messiah. And so for us who are Christians... The star marked the spot, the precise location of our treasure and the person who was the fulfillment of God's promise to provide the Messiah, our Savior, the one who is Christ the Lord. Or as our call to worship reminded us from Galatians 4, when the time had fully come, God sent His Son. To deliver His people from their sins. This morning as we begin a series of sermons on Advent to turn our attention to celebrate what God has done for His church, we have multiple texts. But the one I'll begin with is the familiar one. And then we'll have others that inform us our understanding of the familiar one of John chapter 3 verses 16 through 19. So with ears to hear of the Messiah and His advent, His coming, give your attention to John 3, verses 16 through 19. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people have loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Let's pray for God's blessing, our understanding of His Word. 
Lord, I would pray this morning for all of us that you would fill our hearts with hope in what you have done in your only Son. How you have come into darkness with your light to deliver your people from their sins. Lord, may our hope be in Jesus. We ask this and we pray it in His name. Amen. So here's a Christmas question. Why would God give His Son, His only Son, John emphasized, to be a sacrifice for the sins of His people? The answer to that is a pretty simple one. It's because God had promised to. God had made a promise long before that He would send a deliverer to save His people from their sins. This morning, we've defined two terms already. Good terms to talk about at lunch, parents, with your children. We've defined Messiah. We've defined Advent. But let's do one more just for the sake of clarity. That is the word promise. So we're talking about God as a promise maker. We need to make sure we understand that term. A declaration of assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. That's the definition, a definition of promise. And so this morning we're talking about the promise, God's promise of Christmas, which is that He would do a particular thing or that a particular thing would happen. We live in a world that's familiar with the language of promise. The Bible's familiar with the language of promise, or more so the word covenant. But in our world, we're really familiar, really probably more familiar with promise breaking than we are promise keeping. And I want you to think about that, whether you're young or old. You have memories that probably come to mind quickly of a time when someone told you, yes, we will do this, or yes, I will do this, and they disappointed. They didn't come through. That's the hurt of promise breaking. And every parent knows what it is to be a promise breaker to their children. When we say we will do something for a birthday or a holiday, and then plans change... And we can't do that particular thing. And we know what it is for our kids to feel crushed. Or you remember what it was to be a child and to feel crushed. And for someone to say, but, but Dad, you said... And we have to say, we'll do it, we'll do it again another time. We live in a world where we have serious and silly experiences with promise breaking. But as we look to the promise of Christmas this morning, I want you to see the profound beauty and joy that stirs up our worship because God does not break His promises. God is right on time, on His time, to do what He says He would do. And that is what we celebrate as we live in a world that knows the hurt of promises broken while we live with the hope of promises kept, God's promises kept. So three things for us to consider this morning or to be rooted in in our celebration of Christmas. The first is this, Christmas, it's the promise of old. Where was this promise of Christmas? Well, the very first promise of Christmas, we believe, comes in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the Lord coming in judgment against the serpent and his disobedient first man and first woman, where he says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And here's the promise of Christmas. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The word Messiah is not yet used here, but later in Scripture it is. And in capturing that whole big picture of Scripture and seeing what God has promised, 
we look back and we see this is the first time God promised to do something about sin and rebellion against Him. And what did He promise? He promised that from the offspring of the woman would come a head crusher, would come a a deliverer, one who would crush the head of the serpent and put an end to sin. Later in Numbers Later in Numbers chapter 24, there's another painting of a picture of a promise where in verse 17 it says, a star, remember X marks the spot, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. And this is a prophecy anticipating something that was not near It was far away, but it was a word given to the people of God to expect something, to believe in the promise, but God's people were to wait for it. They were to wait with patience. And every child knows what it is to wait with patience for Christmas morning or any other cherished occasion. How much longer until Christmas? How many more days until Christmas? We have in our home a a decorative counter that counts down the days for Christmas. And you probably have something similar. But children, you get to learn to wait with patience. It's coming. It's coming. In God's timing, it's coming. And really, this waiting with patience, another way to put it, would would be to say, wait with faithful endurance. Press on. Carry on in your faith. Don't give up. Be patient. And so God has always told His people, be patient, it's coming. And you know the story of the Old Testament. We've actually visited this several times this calendar year. But the Old Testament is a story of person after person, family after family, king after king, prophet after prophet, priest after priest, of being a failed figure who was impatient, who was pointing us to the need for something and someone who is greater. The whole story of the Old Testament is one of anticipating, one of waiting for God's promises to come true. So this week I discovered... um, well, it was a great blessing to me. Uh, it's, a, it's a Christmas children's music album. And somehow it had escaped me for these years. It actually is from 2015. Uh, but to those who are parents of small children, or to anyone, uh, I commend you to it. It's called Waiting Songs. It doesn't sound like a Christmas album, or does it? It's the theme of Christmas, not waiting on God's promise. And so it's called Waiting Songs, and it's some of the more familiar Christmas hymns, one of which we'll conclude our service with, as well as some additional new songs that are preparing us to wait. We might say, hold on, people. God's promise will come true. Hold on. Endure in your faith. Be patient, because God will prove Himself faithful to His promises. Tim Keller says of Christmas, Christmas means that we are so lost, so unable to save ourselves, that nothing less than the death of the Son of God Himself could save us. And that is what we celebrate at Christmas. And we're called to wait with patience until the Lord provides Him. Isaiah the prophet, speaking of waiting and anticipating said that the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call Him Emmanuel. And so they were to wait, to wait with patience. We're told a virgin somehow, mysteriously, miraculously, a virgin will be with child and He will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, and so we wait until God fulfills His promise. 
And in time, God would. Our second point is that Christmas is the promise fulfilled. That He has come. And that that is what we are celebrating at Christmas. The long expected one. The anticipated one. The one hoped for did finally come into the world. Matthew says in his Gospel, in verses 22 and 23, he says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Matthew announces that what we have been waiting for, for all these hundreds of years, it has come. And the child's name is Emmanuel. And we know Emmanuel by the name Jesus. The king who was born, the promise was fulfilled, and he came to save his people from their sins. John Calvin says, The task of the Messiah was to restore us, to make us children of God, heirs of heaven rather than hell. Only the Son of God could accomplish this by becoming a Son of Man, taking our condition upon Himself that He might transfer His condition upon us by grace. He became flesh and bone to become like us and to unite us to Himself. We have the hope of a heavenly inheritance because God's Son has adopted us as His brothers. And if His brothers, then we are co-heirs with Him. That's the promise of Christmas. That's what we celebrate. Beyond the reds and the greens and the lights, we celebrate a gift, the gift of God, the fulfillment of promise given to us at Christmas. You may remember, I'm sure most of you have seen it, but in 2005, there was a crayon and pencil drawing that became very popular thanks to the internet. It was the picture of Mary and Eve that was drawn by Sister Grace Remington. And I think we have a picture of it. I believe that we do. We do. You've seen that picture. You're familiar with that picture. And it's a beautiful summary of so much that the gospel tells us. The fulfillment of promise. If you look at the picture, what you see, of course, is Eve on the left. And she's clutching that apple, that forbidden fruit that you might be able to see has a small bite taken out of it. And as she's clutching that apple, you'll see she's also being clutched by a serpent. And then you'll see that she's being consoled by the mother of Jesus, consoling her countenance and her face while taking the hand of Eve and putting it on the source of promise. The promise that one would come who would do what? Crush the head of the serpent. Now here you see Eve crushing the head of the serpent, but we understand it was the child that would be born who was the crusher of the head of the serpent. Now going back, connecting that picture. Remember I told you I came upon a a Christmas CD for children that was a blessing to me this week called Waiting Songs. And one of the songs on there that somehow I had never heard before, it's sung by Sandra McCracken. And the lyrics to it all come from this visual, from this painting that folks were so interested in in recent years. And and the song, the lyrics of the song, have an imaginary conversation between these two women. And it really is beautifully done and captures the gospel well. But in that imaginary conversation between these two women, these are some of the lyrics to the song that summarize God's promise. So it's Mary speaking to Eve here. And she says, Eve, it's Mary. 
Now I'm a mother too. The child I carry is a promise coming true. This baby comes to save us from our sin. A servant king, his kingdom without end. Almost, not yet, but already. Almost, not yet, but already. He comes to make his blessings flow as far and wide as the curse is found. Almost, not yet, but already. And that refrain captures a a tension, a Christmas tension I want us to consider this morning. That language that those of you who have studied any theology, remember that we live in the tension of the already, but the not yet. That Christ has secured salvation for us, but we are not yet in heaven. And we live in the tension between these two extremes. And she captures that theology and brings it to life in our thinking of the tension between these two women. That we live already, almost, but not yet, into the fulfillment of every promise that God has made. But for now, we live after the first advent, the first coming of Jesus. But you remember, and this is our third point, we are awaiting another advent. We look back on one advent, but we look forward to yet a second advent. And our third point is this. Christmas, the promise that He will come again. And so when we sing a hymn, Like, come thou long expected Jesus. You know that our instinct, and it's a good one, it's right, is to pretend that we're those people long ago who sang about the hope of a nativity scene. Come thou long expected Jesus. And it is not wrong for us to think in those terms. But we think of more than that. We sing those words, come thou long expected Jesus, concerning His second advent that we are waiting for. His glorious coming again for His church to take them to be as His holy bride forever. And so the Christmas promise for us is that He will come again. We live between the two advents. We live in the tension of the two advents And all God's promises coming true in Jesus. And like those Old Testament saints, we too are called to wait for it with patience. And is that not the sum of the Christian life for you? You are to wait with patience, with faithful endurance for the coming of the Lord Jesus. His second coming, not His first coming coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 speaks to this waiting. It says, "We wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come." You see, it's all forward speaking for him. It's not just backwards thinking, it's forward thinking. And so the promise of Christmas is one of two advents. His first coming that we celebrate, which is behind us. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's a second advent that we celebrate. One that we sing, Come thou long expected Jesus. We are waiting. We want to be found faithfully enduring, persevering as your people. So Lord Jesus, would you come? Would you come quickly? We live in a world of broken promises. We live in a world that hurts with broken promises. But oh, the joy of promises kept. And God is the faithful promise keeper. None of the promises that He has made has He failed to fulfill. And so it will be with that promise of His second coming, His second advent where He ultimately delivers His people from the very presence of our sins. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says loudly and clearly what we celebrate in the gift of Christmas. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's your Christmas gift. It's the gift of Christ. It's the fulfillment of promise that He sent the Deliverer, the Messiah, the Redeemer to save His people from their sins. And this morning, as we sing of Emmanuel, God with us, we sing with thanksgiving for His first advent, but can we agree we sing with anticipation of His second advent? Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's pray, and then we'll come to the table. Lord, we do rejoice that You are the fulfiller of Your promises and that none of them have failed to come to pass. And Lord, with that same faith, we look forward to You fulfilling all of Your promises in the future. So Lord, would You bless us with an increase of faith that we would look forward to Your second advent as the people of God should. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.